Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Outside, it looks like spring. It doesn't feel like spring when you walk out there, but it looks like spring and I'm so excited that it's March. Uh, I I'm happy that you're joining us. Aparna Kaji Shah is joining Junction Reads again in a virtual format. We were lucky enough to uh, be with each other physically the last time. Um, so Aparna, thank you so much for joining us again. Welcome. Thank you, Alison, and thank you, Kaylee, for having me. It's wonderful to be at Junction again, though virtually. Yes. And I would like to thank everyone who's present with us this evening. Uh, there are lots of people, I believe, and there are some from California, oh, as okay. well as from Sydney, Australia. So I'm honored to have so many people attending here this evening. That is fantastic. Thank you so much for coming from uh, Sydney, Australia. Um, so before we get started, I'm going to start with our land acknowledgement. Um, then I will uh, introduce what we're gonna be talking about today. I am today sitting in Tekaranto, which for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Wendat, Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with, with the Mississaugas of the Credit. It is still home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on their territory. And as some of you are outside of the uh, territory of Tecoronto, um, if you'd like to just take a moment to personally acknowledge the land on which you are standing, uh, that would be great. So before we get started, Aparna, I would like to ask you what you are currently reading. I have read many wonderful books over the last few months, especially because of the pandemic. I feel I get a lot more reading done. Yes. And and uh, the two books that I would like to recommend, really awesome books. One is Shaggy Bain by Douglas Stewart. It won the Booker Prize in 2020. And this is the story about uh, a boy. He's seven or eight years old when the novel begins and he's 16 at the end of the novel. It's about his close relationship with his mother and how he takes care of her because she is an alcoholic and she cannot take care of him in any way at all. Um, so Douglas Stewart is a Scottish American writer. The novel is set in Glasgow and uses quite often the Glaswegian slang, which is very, very interesting and very musical in some ways. The second book that I'd like to recommend is uh, a novel by Madeline Miller. Uh, the novel is Circe, or some people pronounce it as Circe. She's the Greek demigoddess, right. and uh, she's the daughter of the sun god Helios. She has been exiled uh, to a very isolated island, and she turns into a witch, and she there are soldiers who come ashore who try to molest her and she turns them into pigs. But more than, the, more than the plot and action of the novel, what is really fascinating about this work is the psychological insights that Miller gives us into Circe's mind. It is a first person narration and you can, one can relate to Circe as one would to any modern woman. Wow. It's an amazing book. I highly recommend it. And especially with since International Women's Day is coming up tomorrow. Yep. It's this is a feminist take on the Greek myth. Fantastic. That sounds so interesting. I've I I'm uh, Shuggy Bain is on my uh, uh, to be read list. It's yes. A very, very long list. <laughs> <laughs> So before we get started to, uh, in our readings, I just wanted to tell everybody we're, we're kind of changing it up a little bit. Um, Aparna is going to share three uh, short excerpts from three different stories, so you're very lucky. Um, and so we're gonna start with a, a reading, an excerpt from one, I'm gonna ask a question. Aparna is gonna share an excerpt from another, I'm gonna ask a question. And then after the last reading, I'm gonna ask a couple of other questions and then we're gonna open it up to you guys. 
So feel free, just message Kaylee or write something into the chat and uh, Kaylee will ask the question on your behalf. So before I uh, officially introduce Aparna and her reading, I'm going to share your biography, if that's okay. Sure. Aparna Kaji Shah was born in Mombasa and grew up in Mumbai. She has a master's degree in English and aesthetics from the University of Bombay and a master's of philosophy in English from SNDT University, Mumbai. After she moved to Canada in 1985, she obtained a bachelor's of education from the University of Toronto. She and her husband and their family have lived for various periods in the UK, India, and Singapore. She and her husband returned permanently to Canada in 2013 and continue to live in Toronto. Her fiction has been included in several anthologies. The Scent of Mogra and Other Stories is her debut collection of short fiction and was published by Inanna Publications. Aparna. I hand thank it over. You, uh, thank you, Alison, for that introduction. And I'm going to read uh, my first passage from a story called The Last Letter. This story is written in the form of letters by a young village bride called Sureka, who has now moved to the city of Mumbai because her husband works in the city. So she writes letters back home to her brother, to her parents, and to her friend. Unfortunately, her husband, Anand, turns out to be an alcoholic and a womanizer, and poor Sureka is stuck in this poky little flat in Mumbai with no connections, no friends, and no money. Fortunately, she is able to make friends with another man called Suresh. That gives her some comfort. So I'm reading a section of a letter that she writes to her brother. Every morning when Anand leaves for work, it is such a relief. I can breathe again. But once the evening shadows begin to lengthen and the sun goes down, the walls close in on me. I gasp for breath. I pace up and down like a caged animal. Once I rushed out of the house and went to Suresh's office, not caring about the consequences, Sometimes I just sit in the lobby of the building and stare into space. I get pitying glances as people return home. Some think I'm crazed and maybe I am because a few times I have rushed out onto the street and walked fast like the traffic rumbling past me. I think about walking into cars and getting run over, but then I have a scary thought. What if I don't die but become a cripple? So I turn around and walk back home, trying to slow down my galloping heart and covering my ears with my hands to muffle the sound of the traffic, for those sounds only increase the pounding in my head. As I reach my flat, the pounding becomes fast again. What if Anand has come home early and beats me up because he thinks I had gone to Suresh? I turn the key and open the door. Relief washes over me. There is no one, only the demons of my mind. Then standing in the kitchen, I stuff some food into my mouth. I'm so hungry. Satiated, I lie down on the bed and the walls begin to close in on me again. I yearn for oblivion as I cry myself to sleep. I want to be home, brother. I long to be home. Sureka. I'm reading another very short section from a later letter, again written to her brother. Once again, the monsoons are here with a vengeance. Everything is wet and moldy. I don't feel like stepping out into the rivers of mud with all the trash floating in them. The windows are constantly foggy and wet with the moisture. My eyes are often full of tears. I see a blurred image of everything, even of myself in the mirror. It is as if I'm becoming smaller and smaller, vanishing. Sometimes when the tears flow, the edges of my image are so fuzzy that it appears as if I have no shape, no features. I'm just a blob, a blob of nothing, nobody, no mind, numb, 
feeling less and less every day. And yet, I know myself. I'm there somewhere, maybe not in this body, but floating above it. I don't know. I will be able to see through the windows again when the rains are over. I will be able to see the next building, its tiny shuttered windows and the heaps of stinking waste, rotting banana peel, pieces of roti, splattered rice, plastic bags, and other unspeakable things. My mirror will clear too. And when my eyes are dry, that shapeless blob that is Sureka will be no more. There will only be light, sunlight, as it streams in from the windows. Or a new image of Sureka will be reflected, unflinching, strong, self-contained. That is my favorite story in the collection. It was the first one that I read when I when I uh, first got this book, um, when you joined us the last time, and it is so powerful. It, Sareka is, despite being trapped in, in this marriage, she and all of the other women are so strong, so determined, so resilient, despite the fact that they're at the mercy of the men in their lives, um, whether it's a brother or a husband, um, and that feels like a universal truth. And I wanted to ask you how important it was for you, for readers to see this collection as women's stories and not Indian women's stories. That's a great question, Alison. And I'm glad I have this opportunity to say this. My stories are women's stories. They reflect the condition of all women all over the world. The specifics might be Indian, the details might be Indian, because that's the culture and society I know best. Mm -hmm. But these stories speak for all women. And if you think about it, whether it's in a boardroom on Bay Street in Toronto, whether it's across university campuses across Canada or the US, or whether it's on a public bus or in a bedroom in India, too many women all over the world suffer similar fates. So it is very important that the reader realizes I'm speaking for all women. These stories, I hope, give a voice to the voiceless and the marginalized. Yeah, I definitely think that they do. I, I, I mean, I, I pers personally felt um, in, the, in the first story, I felt connected to, um, uh, gosh, what's her name? Maya? Maya, my God. And her, you know, attraction to this, this um, man who's not going to give her anything. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely, I felt uh, connected to these stories. Uh, so speaking of Maya, I think you're going to share a little excerpt from that. Um, yes, I am. Uh, so Maya, that is the first story in this collection. Um, Maya is my protagonist. She is a single middle-aged woman living in Mumbai, and she is a college professor teaching psychology. So one afternoon, she decides to visit an art gallery after her classes, and this is what happens. So this is really from the second page of the story, so it's quite in the beginning, at the beginning of the story. Maya gazed at the art. She stepped back to get a better look, tucking her shoulder length brown hair behind her ears so that it didn't fall over her eyes. It's a forest, she thought. The brown strokes are the tree trunks, the green leaves thick and lush. A dark, gloomy forest shrouded with mist in the early morning the sun trying to penetrate the vegetation as the day progressed. What if she got lost in this jungle? How would she ever find her way back? She shivered, imagining dusk as it fell, lengthening the shadows of the trees on the forest floor. A young man's movements attracted her attention away from the painted wall. He looked at her 
and she saw that he was not that young after all. He had chiseled features and a mop of unkept dark hair. His almond-shaped eyes looked at her inquiringly as he scratched his unshaven chin. She returned his gaze and their eyes locked briefly. She turned back to the wall and was once again lost in the forest with this man guiding her by the arm. They rested against a tree trunk. The birds called out as they found a place to rest during the dark night, which was rapidly descending upon them. She looked at the man and he, holding her hand, looked deep into her eyes. Without a word, they both slid down on the forest floor and turned towards each other, her breasts almost, but not quite, touching his chest. Excuse me, the man's voice startled her. She whirled around to face him, and as she did so, her dupatta slid down her shoulders and fell to the floor. They both bent down to pick it up. He got there first, and as they straightened up their faces close to each other, they laughed. She, embarrassed, he with delight, as he admired the orange-yellow color of the fabric. When she stretched out her slim, pale hand to take it from him, he grinned at her and put the dupatta against his kurta, which was a pale yellow. Then he returned the dupatta to her. They stood there smiling at each other and she imagined lying down with him on the forest floor. He said, you have spent a long time looking at these paintings. Are you an artist? Oh no, she said, my friend owns this gallery. I stop by sometimes. He's about 10 years younger than me, she thought. Are you an artist? Look, there's a nice little cafe behind this gallery. I was planning to go there. Why don't we go there and chat? My name is Rahul. Maya saw that the gallery was filling up and they would be disturbing the viewers by talking. Her throat was parched and she was longing for a cup of tea. Okay, why not? She smiled, then added, I'm Maya. They made their way out the door and went around the building to the cafe entrance. He's tall, she thought, as she glanced at him sideways. His body was muscular and lean as if he worked out every day. Her own body, though still slim, was soft like ripe fruit, her arms sagging a little. Thank God they were covered by three-quarter sleeves. The cafe was quiet. They chose a table close to a wall. A few framed black and white photographs hung on the wall, photographs of Bombay of an earlier era. Now, Bombay was very different. It was Mumbai. Here she was with the strange man, when by now she should have been at her mother's place. Her phone vibrated and she told her mother that she was delayed and would be there soon. She let out a sigh and Rahul raised his eyebrows while a crooked smile lifted the left corner of his lips. Well, this is unplanned, Maya said, and I have a lot of things to do this evening. Some of the best things are spontaneous, don't you think? She nodded, and her mind took her to a different time and a different place. That's so great. Um, I love Maya so much and she's so unlike Sarika and all of the other women in the story and yet they are connected again not just because of their of their their living at the whim of of the men in their lives but um there's there's just uh, a natural connection among the women and the stories I'm wondering and I always I'm always curious about this when I look at, at collections of short stories because as a writer and as a writer of short stories, I just write them when the ideas come and I have no idea in my mind whether they're going to connect in any way. So I'm wondering because of the of the themes moving through the, the collection, if you knew these stories, these women were going to live together in this book. When I started writing these stories, I had no idea that I would write stories that were connected both emotionally and thematically. I wrote the, the first four stories. And when I wrote the fourth one, 
I realized that there was a definite connection, not just by theme, about women's lives in a male dominated society and about their resilience, but there was a connection because each of these women go through such an emotional journey before actually the present crisis begins. Mm -hmm. The journey starts much earlier before the present crisis that we talk about in each story begins. Yeah. So it was only after I finished four stories and I handed them to Inanna and they accepted them, I wrote two more stories, which again turned out to have the same kind of connection to the other four stories. And so I decided to put them together. Right. And did you, did they exist in this order? Did you know Maya's story was going to go first? Did you, did you have any idea or was that an, a, an editorial? Uh, no, actually, I did not have any idea which story would go first. And I think when I sent them to Inanna Publications, I did perhaps send them in this order, but I'm not sure if it was an editorial decision by the publishers to put them in this order or not. I, I'm not, I can't really remember that. Right, yeah, because there is a natural um, flow to them, you know, this, mm -hmm. this uh, emotional up and down uh, that we experience as, as readers through the story. Um, okay, you're, I'm going to share another little excerpt and then uh, I'll ask a few more questions. If that's okay. okay, so the last excerpt is from the title story, The Scent of Mogra. Now, Mogra is the Indian name for the jasmine flower. And this story is in the first person. And the speaker of the story, the narrator, is an old woman who is dead. So she is a dead woman. She's been dead for over 20 years. And in the world of the dead, wherever that is, she smells the fragrance of the mogra flower. And this scent transports her back to her life on earth. And she reminisces about her life on earth and especially about her daughter, Tina. Her name is Tina who she can see is suffering on earth. And the mother is very upset, the dead mother is very upset that she is suffering on earth. Now this story draws very heavily on the belief in reincarnation. And this lady has been dead for over 20 years, has not yet been reincarnated. But now when I start reading from this passage, she's about to be reincarnated. And she is reborn as a young spiritual leader who lectures on spiritual matters and conducts meditation sessions. So here we go. The scent of Mogra. I'm floating somewhere like a feather. I'm not where the incense was burning and where the fragrance of Mogra filled the air. I'm in a different place and a soft breeze is pushing me along, though I don't have any sense of movement. It seems like I've been here forever, but no, it's not forever. I'm born again. And now it is the reborn woman, the spiritual leader who is the speaker. A woman with gray hair wearing a red and white kurta approaches the stage on which I'm seated and climbs up. I have just finished talking to a room full of about 60 people. The perfume from the strands of mogra flowers that decorate the stage has intensified. I'm hot, but I feel exhilarated by the energy of the people who are now leaving, hopefully more at peace after listening to a talk on the Hindu scriptures and a short meditation session. She covers her head with her red dupatta who is this? I know this lady. Maybe she has come to my talks before. She bows down with folded hands before me. I'm not 30 yet, and I feel uncomfortable when older people do that. She looks up into my eyes and smiles. She says, Mataji, mother, that's what I'm called by my followers, though I would have preferred it if they called me by my name, Sunanda. I really was inspired by your talk. 
I would like a mantra from you that I could chant every day and whenever I'm disturbed. There is something about her. She's at least 75. I can't speak for a few long moments, but just stare into her eyes. Whose voice is this? Why does it sound so familiar? And then she says again, Mataji, so sorry to disturb you. Oh no, you're not disturbing me. It's just that I thought I had met you before. Yes, I'll give you the mantra that will bring peace into your life and to everyone close to you. Will you come to the lecture next week? I'll give it to you then. She says, this is my first time here and yes, I'll be here next week. She hesitates, then adds, you know, I feel I know you too. You remind me of my mother, though you are so young. My mother passed on many, many years ago, of course. With hands folded together in a namaste, she bows to me once again and moves away to make place for the next person in line waiting to see me. I know who she is now. My eyes follow Tina until she reaches the door. Her red dupatta slips down the back of her head, revealing shoulder length hair, gleaming silver in the brightly illumined hall. She takes her coat from the rack and buttons it up to her chin. She quickens her pace, smiling, as she thinks of meeting her grandchildren soon for dinner. Then she walks out into a chilly fall evening in Toronto. Very nice. I, I was so moved reading this collection, not, not just by the, the emotional experiences the women were having um, in grief. Uh, there's there's a, a, a lot of death or the experience of death in the collection um, and the emotions that go with that, of course. But there's a, a very deep spirituality in, in the collection. And you mentioned Hinduism and reincarnation. And, and I, I wonder how that influenced the writing of each of these stories. Um, cause, because even though reincarnation isn't, isn't mentioned in all of the stories, it's difficult for me when, especially the last story um, with Madhu discovering the, the photo of her mother and her mother uh, dying a, a week after she was born. Um, I feel like there's, there's a definite base for that mother in the room. So can yeah. you, yeah, just, I just wanted to talk about the, the influence of, of spirituality on the writing. Yeah, I think, I mean, I wasn't conscious of that as I was writing for sure. Um, when I was writing The Scent of Mogra, uh, I had no clue that there would be several uh, characters in the story that were reincarnated. There is also Mega, who is an earlier reincarnation perhaps of Tina, right. the daughter that the mother is worried about. And then of course the mother is reincarnated. And even in the Ba story, Ba lives on in her grandson, mm -hmm. though she succumbs to her, her terminal illness, but in a way she defeats death because she lives on in her grandson because she has such a significant impact on him. Mm -hmm. In Maya, once again, there is some idea, not really of reincarnation, but Maya does at times later in the story when she misses her mother so much more, mm -hmm. she almost sees her sitting at the dining table, sitting elsewhere in the house. So I, I don't, I'm not conscious that uh, or while I was writing that this was happening. But later when I read the collection myself, after handing it over to Inanna, I realized that this runs through the whole connect, uh, collection. And though I was never consciously ever taught about these things, or I don't consciously remember reading about these things, but I think growing up in Mumbai amongst, you know, with family, friends, it is almost like osmosis. You just absorb some of these influences, which are then uh, when you write or when you paint, you know, they just come across. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, it is not done consciously at all. This yeah. is an influence that I was unaware of actually. 
Right. And I wonder if, if you had consciously done it, if it wouldn't, if it wouldn't have ended up being heavy handed and, you know, like, yes, want the reader to take a message away from, from the collection. That's right. That's right. And I know I never wanted to give any message at all of that kind to the reader. Yeah. What do you, and and I, I often think about this. Do you, do you have something you want a reader to think about before they read the book? Definitely. I think that's very important. And uh, especially because this uh, collection is to do with women, the, the, the condition of their lives, and their fates, the injustices, abuses that they face uh, all over the world. Um, I think I would like the reader, even before opening the book, to consider the exploitation and marginalization of women through the ages, and then further consider how things are the same and how things are different for women today. Mm -hmm. And when they open the book, they will find two stories that are set in an earlier period. The story No Other Way, which is set in around about the 18th century or so, and the story Vidya, which is set in pre-independence India. And, and see whether they think things with regard to domestic abuse how much has changed today? Do we have the same amount of domestic abuse, the same degree? What about um, um, molestation by people that are known to the family? Vidya yeah. is molested by her own father-in-law. Yeah. So how much has really changed? Yes, there might be a token a board member, a director in a corporation on Bay Street in Toronto or, a, you know, but we are not talking about tokenisms here, talking about what real changes have happened between now and then. Yeah. So I would like the reader to consider this before they begin to read the book. Yes. And it, as you mentioned, it is International Women's Day tomorrow. So uh, feel free to pick up a, a, a book written by a woman on your bookshelf and, and give it to somebody, give it to a man in your life. Sorry, I have got a dog hair flying into my eye. Um, yeah, because I, I really do think that we we need, and it's not just, I, I don't want to expose all men, but I really do think that men need to be reading more women. They need to be reading more um, collections of stories like this. I agree with you that men need to read more women writers and see more films directed by women, etc. Yes, yeah. Um, Kaylee, do we have any questions from Anyone? Um, yes, we do. Um, we have a question from Rana. And Rana asks, um, which story is your favorite and or which character resonates the most with you? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, well, I would say the, 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 my favorite story is probably the title story, The Scent of Mogra, because it goes across generations in some ways the mother, the daughter, the previous incarnation of the daughter, and then the reborn mother. So I find that a reincarnation to me is quite fascinating. But the character that I most sort of would identify with is perhaps Maya. I think perhaps just because she lives in modern day Mumbai, uh, in that sense, I think I do find that I would uh, relate more to Maya. And that's great. <laughs> Any more, Kaylee? Mm -hmm. um, Mary has a question and Mary asks, can you tell us what inspired one or two of the stories? Okay, so yes, I would say that when I start writing, it is often an image that flashes before me and that's how I begin writing. For example, the Maya story, I remember very, very vividly that I, I was living in Mumbai at the time. I was looking out from my balcony at the ocean and I suddenly saw in, in my mind an image of this woman who then happened to be Maya, middle-aged woman, clutching on to the entrance of an art gallery door and looking inside and seeing all these yellow walls, the murals on the walls. So 
I get inspired by these images that I see. Some uh, one or two of the stories, for example, the story Bar and the story The Scent of Mogra, those characters are partially based on my mother. Oh, very nice. So, so I would say my mother was an inspiration for those stories. Oh, very nice. I love the analogy when you read Maya, I meant to say this after you finished. I love that uh, that portrait, that 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 um, painting that uh, that is used in the story. I thought it was very powerful. I loved mm -hmm. I enjoyed that. Thank you. Uh, Kaylee, do we have any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, we have another question from Mary. And why did you choose the epistolary form for the Sureka story? That's a great question. Yes, I love that form. I think it lends itself to uh, po the portrayal of a character's emotions, thoughts, and feelings. It is not as, as you know, it's not dialogue driven or action driven. It's really what you want to, uh, you want the reader to feel close to the character who writes these letters. And that is what the epistolary form does. It helps the reader feel closer to the character because the emotions are just there in front of you uh, revealed. And also, I think uh, when, for example, Sureka writes to three different people, she writes to her brother, her parents, and to her friend, and the tone of each letter is very different because it reflects her relationship with each individual. I mean, with the parents, it's a little more distant because she doesn't want to reveal everything to her parents right away. She is very close to her brother. And with her friend, she can talk about more of uh, intimate details about her marriage. So I think the epistolary reform lends itself to this. And I wanted to show the increasing despera uh, desperation of this character. I mean, she's very excited when she first moves to Mumbai. It's a city of dreams, it's a big city. And then as time goes by, she sees Anand for what he really is. Yeah, I love the epistolary, I love the epistolary form. And I, uh, I'm glad you mentioned desperation because I was gonna say the letters to the brother are, are to me the most raw and the most desperate um, because it, she's, meeting with him almost, you know? Uh, yes. That was very good, very good. Kaylee, are there any other questions? Yeah, we have two more questions. Um, our penultimate question is from Anuja or Anuja. And Anuja asks, have you thought about expanding any of the stories into a novel? Uh, it's, uh, it's funny that you asked that Anuja because, uh, you know, the story No Other Way is actually a modified chapter from a, uh, of the, from a manu the ma manuscript of a novel that I'm actually working on right now. Oh, very exciting. Yes. So I am working on a novel right now and that story is one of the chapters. Now it has changed completely that chapter. Right. But when I first put it together, it was from that book. That's the inspiration. Oh, that's yes. I love that. I love that. Okay, last question, sadly. Yeah, last question, and this ties actually really, really well into what you just answered. Mm -hmm. um, but Shashi asked um, if you are working on your next book already. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes, I am working on my next book. It is a, an exciting story. I think it's exciting because it's filled with some terrifying incidents with some exciting experiences where a young woman goes on a journey. She undertakes the journey which transforms her life, but it also changes her as a human being. And the novel is really about cultural identity. It is about belonging or not belonging. It is about uh, home. What is home? Mm -hmm. It raises the question of what home means. And I think a lot of us who've come from different places and from different parts of the world, can relate to that, what is home? And uh, I think a lot of us carry that with us, the memories, the nostalgia of a different place. It becomes part of who we are. Right. That is so exciting. Is it, uh, is it close? 
<laughs> I'm still working on it. Not sure how long it will be, but I, I mean, I have to really work at it now. I do. The pandemic has been very helpful for that. I have been right. sitting down every day. Uh, I've been working on that manuscript. Oh, good for you. That's that's amazing. Um, so I am excited to tell everybody that we've got two copies of Aparna's book to raffle off. Uh, Aparna has uh, generously donated a copy that she has. And uh, in Nana, I've got two copies, one that I purchased on my own and one that was donated, uh, given to me by Inanna. I asked for a reading copy, uh, thinking that I uh, couldn't, well, I couldn't find the other one because we moved since, uh, since the reading. Um, and then I ended up finding it. So I've got a copy and Aparna's got a copy. And so we're going to have two raffles. Ailey has taken uh, everyone's name who registered for the event on Eventbrite and she's put them into her magic uh, box. And here we go. All right. We'll raffle off. So the first copy, the first copy is going to go to Lisa de Nicolet. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> that I'm extremely excited. Um, I have actually my own copy of this, but I'm going to treasure this copy and give it as a gift to somebody because this is an astonishing collection of stories and I just love it to pieces. And yeah, the last letter always makes me cry and they're just so vivid and such amazing stories. So I'll be the very, very grateful recipient. And um, yeah, it will be a very treasured gift to someone. So. Thank you. And very nice to see everybody. Yes. Thank Lisa, you, Lisa. Lisa, will you email me your mailing address and I'll get I that will do you. that, my love. Yes. Right. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. And all right. And our second copy. Our second copy is going to go to Rashmi Karnadjani. Rashma, are you here? I try to check in with uh, the list before I add everybody's names. They were here before, so we can try to touch base with. Okay. Them. All right. I, I will find them on um, on the Eventbrite uh, Aparna, and I will send you their details, or sure. I'll connect you. Um, if they if they live in Toronto, I'm happy to just come and get it from you and and deliver it so that we can save. Them. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think she lives in Toronto. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. That's good. That's good. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, we have a full month before we get back together again. We've, we had some schedule, uh, schedule changes because of stuff that's going on in, in my life personally and because of Passover and um, uh, the schedule had to change. So we are not back here at Junction Reads until April 11th. Uh, by then, I will not be wearing a turtleneck sweater. I'll <laughs> be wearing something flowy and flowery. Um, and so we will welcome in April three writers, uh, Sarah Kerchak, Sharon Kirsch, who is here uh, this evening, and Marissa Stapley is bringing us her latest uh, romantic thriller uh, novel. So thank you so much. Please follow us on uh, Facebook social media. Go to our website, junctionreads.ca just to get an update on our schedule. And Kaylee has also shared information on Aparna's website just in the chat if you wanted to uh, take down those details before we leave you this evening. Again, Aparna, thank you so much for joining us. Thank this you, Alison and Kaylee for having me. And I really enjoyed myself. I hope everyone else did too. Yes, me too. This collection is fantastic. It's available in most independent bookstores in Toronto um, and uh, abroad or online. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what uh, Australia is. On Amazon, yeah, Amazon, yeah, Australia, UK, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Aparna, again. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. It's still sunny outside, so uh, maybe we can all go for a walk. It's a good um, idea. <laughs> yes, exactly. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.